Okay. Do you hold on? I think it's just gonna put on presentation mode here if he's gonna go through. Okay, can everyone see my screen, Sandro? Yeah, yeah perfect. Okay. So the topic we're going to talk about today, as Sandro mentioned, is a bit of a, uh, event management, event organization. So uh, I think the first, uh, the first thing I wanted to mention, I mean, for those who are familiar with tennis, this might be a, a silly slide, but for those who doesn't know tennis very well, I wanted to present a global footprint. Uh, so tennis is a very fragmented organization of uh, sport. Um, we have seven governing bodies with they're very powerful in tennis that pretty much rule our sport, which is uh, the ATP, which is the men's uh, organization, the WTA, the women's organization, the ITF, which is the International Tennis Federation, and then the four Grand Slams. So uh, between these seven governing bodies, uh, they really fight and in a good way, right? They, they, they are the ones, the pillars that uh, sustain our sport. We, we often, say that, often say that tennis is a truly global uh, sport um, and maybe only compared to soccer, we're on the five continents. Uh, we have uh, 100 plus uh, ATP and WTA events across the globe that distributes over uh, $250 million in prize money. Uh, there is about, you know, the latest census, about 90 million tennis players across the world. Um, and which of those, about 4,000 of them are professional tennis players. When we talk about uh, also tennis uh, as being a men and women sport, uh, that is something that has been on the light for the first few years, tennis is a very uh, equal sport in terms of prize money. So we have the four, prends, four Grand Slams that distribute the same prize money. And then we have the five top tier events on the men's and the women's also play as a combined event. And they all also offer the same prize money. So this is very important uh, as this is a, to a sensitive topic, has been a sensitive topic for the past few years. And moving forward, I think the ATP is uh, on the front run on, on against other sports that do not have this uh, uh, politics of um, equal rights. Speaking a little bit about IMG tennis, where my world is, uh, IMG, it's uh, one of the global leaders in uh, tennis, especially uh, in event management and also in talent representation. I only work with the, on the event side. There's another segment, another pillar inside the IMG that represents uh, most of the top players in the world, such as Djokovic, Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, Emma Raducanu, and so on and so forth. So um, it's a very, it's a very uh, robust um, uh, strategy on IMG that we have, you know, the events and the players uh, supporting each other. So obviously we need the top uh, talent playing our events and it's good, you know, that next door to us, we have the top talent represented by our company. We are about in a business of about 15 to you know 20 events. Uh, we either own or manage or operate these events or lease these events. There are different business models that I'm gonna go and, and guide you through what the business models are uh, in the next slides so you understand um, how IMG is so powerful and how you know IMG is a private owned company. It's actually a public company now but how we uh, are so successful and how we can make money out of the tennis events, right? This is in the end, this is what event organizers are looking for. So a bit of the footprint also of the tennis, uh, IMG tennis event portfolio, as you can see, we're all over the world. We have offices in the US, in the UK, in Asia, uh, in the Middle East, in South America. So um, all, all these events, they have, uh, as I said, different business models. Some of them are pro events, ATP, some of them are pro events, WTA, some are combined, some are exhibitions, uh, some are legends events, so players uh, that have already retired from tennis. Uh, and some of them we don't even operate or manage, we just have, we own the event, but we lease, so we have a partnership with another promoter that runs the event, but obviously we're also responsible. So that's uh, a bit of the, um, how we how we operate uh, as a as a as a division inside of tennis, 
And now I want you to run you guys through how we actually come like came to live this platform of tennis events uh, across the globe of IMG. So I often say there's a four step business model uh, and the different business models uh, when you come to coming together a new event, when you put together a new event from scratch, uh, the, the step number one, I call like the event the DNA. So let's say uh, we are in this room, we know 25 people, we're part of the same company, we need to create a new tennis event. What I my 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 mindset usually is like, what is the event DNA? What do, what's the objective of this event? Uh, you know, how much money you want to make? Is it government funded or is it private funded? Uh, is it a man, women, or is it a combined? Is it a sanctioned event? So do we need the 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 blessing? Or we need to go out there and get a, a sanctioned event from ATP, a WTA, or ITF, or is it a non-sanctioned where we have a lot more flexibility? Uh, and make it like an exhibition so we don't have to report into the tours we just have to create something from from scratch uh, is that a fan driven uh, event meaning uh, do we need like a very big um, fan base in order to put this event together because we can have a big uh, stadium so we need to sell a lot of tickets or is it like a very small corporate event where we're going to be you know, uh, based on a lot of sponsorship revenues and uh, and something that, you know, the costs are lower and the operation is smaller, so we can focus pretty much on corporate. Uh, do we have to have any relationship with the federations, with the local federations, or uh, can we just run the event ourselves? So all these things come into to, to play when we try to take an event from scratch, because is really going to depend on where you have to go find your partners, where you have to be careful about your relationships, right? You don't want to step on anybody's toes. For example, I'm going to use a clear example. If I want to put an event in Australia, you know, there's a Tennis Australia is a very strong federation. So you don't want to go into that market without speaking to Tennis Australia and say, listen, guys, I'm thinking about this event. How, what do you think about it? So, because that can easily, uh, kill your event these people are very powerful they know the business they know the people so again you rely very much on local people as well to guide you through this process we have events in, in india where politics is very complicated or in china where it's even more complicated right we need the chinese is a whole different culture so on this step number one the, the dna process you think all about these variables that you're going to have in order to have a more um, straightforward and, and safer plan going forward. Once you have pretty much the X-ray of the DNA of the event, what you want, how much you want to spend, how much you want to make, obviously these are all projections, uh, then you go into step two, which is, you know, what does your, your fan want? So I want an event like that. This is what I want to focus on. And then what, what is the market? And now I'm going to use clear examples. If you're going to a big market such as New York or London, the people are very demanding. They have options. They have grand slams. They have big events. They're used to the top talented playing. So if you go into these markets with a bad product or not such a top tier product, you're probably going to fail because the people are expect more from you. Now, if you go into a, in a market where you don't have that kind of product, let's just use an example uh if i go into singapore which they don't have an official event uh they they lack content there on, on the tennis so maybe you can go something different or you go to a market uh, like uh i don't know morocco where also they don't have that kind of event so then you can kind of tailor made your event and make it more appealing to the crowd that you're actually going to be talking to uh this is this is very important as well when you and i'm gonna guide you through a you know the reopen case also do you have enough tennis players or tennis fans in the region to sell the tickets that you want to sell or is it more or is it like a smaller fan base that like other things so you have to create ancillary events and ancillary things in order to attract these people to your event and reopen is a very good case that i'm going to run you through and you're going to understand better what I'm saying. So once you understand the DNA and then you 
create the fan experience in your on your mind what you want from this event you go to the step three which is a key vital step which is what are the revenue streams from your event so in tennis uh to simplify obviously there's more than this but to simplify i say there are four revenue main main revenue streams which is sponsors ticket sales corporate hospitality television and on-site um, food and beverage and, and merchandising so on an ATP event, on the Rio event, uh, as I'm going to use, the sponsorship accounts for over 80% of the revenues. Ticket sales is very low, is about 5%. Television is 10%, and the rest is like 5%. So why is that? Again, once you go to the step one and step two, uh, that's going to probably answer your question, is that the Brazilian market are not used to play for, pay for tickets. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of loss uh that allows people to buy half entrance so pay half price for the entrance uh people the rich people that used to should pay for the ticket are used to be invited uh to the events they're not used to pay so usually if you you know sandra will know better but if 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 the guy's the ceo of a company he will never pay for a ticket he's gonna get invited because that's what he expects he's an important person so in the end, you lack that kind of people that is going to pay the big bucks for your tickets. So you cannot count with that revenue for, for too much. Now let's uh, use another example. London is a place known for people paying the, the, the big bucks to, be, to go to the events. Either on the hospitality or the ticket sales, they just pay. Uh, it, it's something, a part of the culture. They don't want to, maybe because they don't want to ask for the ticket, maybe because the culture is not there for an invitation. So then you have to pretty much have on your mind these this different things about the cultures and about the operations of the events in order to adjust uh, uh, your revenues and understand how much you're going to be able to make in order to, to decide how much you're going to be able to spend. And that takes you to stop step four, which I call a live PNL. So I'm not sure how much uh, you guys are into already on your on your classes about you know putting a PNL together and how you know you make money out of this event. Obviously, you have your revenues and then you have your cost, and then you must have like a final result, right? But this is not as simple uh, as it looks on an event because there's so many variables. Again, you're going to have to commit to this event before you find out how many tickets you sell, right? So, which means on your budget, you, you're going to have the expenses, but you have those lines where you can cut in case you don't get the revenues you're expecting. So that's what I call a live PNL. You go, you know, as you, you make more money and then you try to spend a little more or you make less money and then you try to cut costs. So it's a live, so it goes back and forth. Usually, uh, obviously, any company wants to make sure that you, in the end, you have a positive PNL. But in the beginning, it's, it's normal that, you know, for one, two, three years, maybe you break even, maybe you lose some money in order to gain traction and also to understand how the event operates and what are the, the risks and what are the opportunities and extra revenues in order for you to be uh, successful on, uh, on your events, right? So again, just wanna recap. So you have to think about the characteristics, characteristics of your event. You wanna understand what's your fan, you wanna understand what your revenues is, and then you wanna understand how much you're gonna be able to spend in order to operate. So uh, I wanted to take you uh, for the last thing on, on this presentation about the reopen case. Uh, so as uh, Sandra said, I'm a, the tournament director in this event. This event is starting in 2014. Out of a PowerPoint presentation, which is a very nice story, uh, back in 2012 when IMM, the company that owns this event, bought this event, uh, we, had a, we had a dream, we had a vision, uh, but we didn't have anything so we just started from scratch like i told you from the beginning so we sat on a room many times actually we sat a few times on the beach as well with a coconut looking at the sky and wondering like how we're gonna make this event successful i mean it's rio de janeiro uh in 2014 that's when the world cup was playing in brazil 2016 was the olympic games we're kicking off this huge event with a two big competitors if you want to put this way because obviously they were taking money out of the market from the sponsorship marketing, from the ticket sales marketing. So 
uh, we, we were under a lot of risk, but we also had IMG uh, in order to guide us through the through the process of creating this new event in Rio. Uh, so we find this very nice setting, uh, jockey club, we thought uh, with ourselves. Brazil doesn't have the fan base in order to put 6,000 people on the stands every day. We need to create something that is more than tennis. We need to ex explore entertainment. We need to uh, think of other ways to bring people to Rio, to, to our event in Rio. And um, Rio is a known city for lifestyle. People, uh, you know, the beach and, and the sports culture. So we thought, hey, how about if you create an all experience event? So we started the event uh, with obviously, obviously the tennis being the main content, but what else can we create around to attract people? So we say we often say we have four pillars right now, in, in, aside from tennis in the in the Rio Open. One is music. We have music at the end of every session, pretty much uh, at at the event. So obviously we cannot compete with the the noise. Uh, tennis is a very silent sport, which is very boring. We'd love to change that, but I think it's gonna be it's gonna take a few more years. So every time at the end of the play, we used to you know put some bands to play for the fans so they could actually extend their entertainment then we have gastronomy so we have the top restaurants in uh in rio uh, putting pocket um structures uh, at our event in order to offer a good gastronomy experience by no means you know the player the, the people would go there for the food only but if they could go for the tennis and for the food then we, have, we felt like we could attract more people to our event then we had a pill of art. Uh, we feel like art is very attached to the tennis because in Brazil, uh, whoever plays tennis is, you know, uh, a bit high-end public uh, and these people also like art. So we introduce uh, every year, we, we have an artist drawing the image of the event and exposing some of his, uh, of his artwork at our event. So that kind of get the, the feel of the art being part of Rio. Again, I want to say that not that people would just come to reopen just because they want to see art, but we could talk to these people that like art through, you know, PR and through other other outlets in order to say, hey, you open is a fun place to go. Why don't you just come and visit? And then lifestyle, obviously, uh, lifestyle, we often say this, you know, a lot of artists and a lot of actors and a lot of sport, famous sportsmen. So we want to invite these people just to you know in, be entertained at our event. So people that are following the event through social media, they they have this whole uh, uh, feeling about you know being a cool event, a lifestyle event. So uh, again, I already guide you through this, but you know again the pillars: gastronomy, the restaurants, the best restaurants in town the art with you know the local artists creating the image of the event and exposing some of their artwork the music with the bands uh at the end of uh, every uh session and then the lifestyle also yeah i missed that also the boutique uh which we met we felt like people wanted to take home something memorable of the event so we created a boutique with some products but you know more than more than that is just the whole experience about being part of the event um, somehow and being able to to extrapolate this uh, this experience uh, and then a few of the images that I, 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 I explained to you in our gastronomy area people could stay in and have a good time and then our sponsors activating the event which is very important for us uh, the, the, the the picture right the the moment of the picture of the event, which is also very important because, you know, nowadays the social media is a very important tool. So you want to, you know, pe people taking pictures of a cool spot and be able to post. So people say, oh, hold, hold on. This is a cool event. Why don't we go? So the, again, and then obviously uh, different activations that you can see on these pictures from, um, from the reopen project. And then I just just before I open to questions, Sandro, I just wanted to again wrap up saying again, you know how how fun it is to create an event from scratch. You know, he opened obviously something huge, 
uh, I don't expect you guys to 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 be uh, be able to do it uh, from night to from one day to the other. But this is something that you know any small or big event takes a lot of work and needs a structure. So once you think about event management and event creation, uh, think about these four steps that I mentioned to you. Think about what you want, what your goal is, what your vision, and obviously uh, because. Uh, I mean, you, we are not a fundraiser, so you need to think about where you're going to take the money from and how you're going to be able to pay for all these, uh, these dreams that you have uh, on this new event. So this is a bit of the presentation. Sandro, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have or your students have uh, about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. Very, very inspiring from um, not only the information and your views, but also very inspiring to hear the story of Rio. And um, or even taking note here of almost like the festivalization of uh, tennis tournaments that in some markets are needed. Um, and um, yeah, really, really interesting. Now, I have a series of questions here, and I think we have about just a bit over than half an hour or so uh, for us to have a chat. Uh, I'm going to start with a question, and then we can see if people will jump in with questions or so. Um, I'm not sure if you can just stop sharing the screen. That will yes. just help us to yeah, see each other. Um, so one of the things that obviously it's um, happening nowadays here in Glasgow is the COP26 and the whole environmental agenda and the environmental debate um, about the world. Um, what are the, the, the strategies that you see at this stage in the tennis, turn, in, in the tennis world about um, uh, environmental strategies and changes, considering there is obviously lots of logistics issues, lots of traveling, but also lots of um, consumption in, in on site so how, how you see things evolving on on, on that side well um in the, in the respect of rio uh, let's just start with rio well we have a sustainability uh platform uh we became last year carbon uh, zero event uh i i guess this is is i often say that um we are sustainability and and this whole topic Sometimes it's something that we don't relate because it's so much bigger than us, right? But it really starts with us, with us home, you know, recycling and, and being careful and being mindful about all the, you know, general waste and, and anything that we can do on that sense. So in Rio, although we are carbon uh, uh, zero event now, uh, what I often say, the legacy uh, of this is how much how much we can influence people, individuals, about also joining this journey with us. So when you go through the tour perspective, I think the tours are a little behind it. I know the ATP announced yesterday that uh, they want to go uh, carbon zero by 2040, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and this is very uh, inspiring, especially to me, because I, I like this topic and I'm a big... The, uh, I'm a big defense of, of you know, uh, having uh, initiatives about on this area. Now, the, the thing is that the tours, they don't own the events, right? They are just, they're just the governing body. So if the tour announces something, what, what must be, is must be part of like the rules that we have to follow. You know, if for a sanctioned event, I didn't mention this in presentation, but obviously if part of the tour events, you have to follow a set of rules from, you know, uh, you know, hotels and transportation and 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 uh, player services and everything that you have to to comply in order to be a, a tour event. So why not include the sustainability component in this rule? So that's what I'm probably going to be looking for now that the tourists start talking about it, because again, it starts with us. It starts with me and you, and it unfolds to 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 a lot more people, and we have to somehow influence people, which is. You know, the reopen is a very tiny, small uh, contribution to the to the whole uh, strategy overall to, to to become a carbon zero world, if you want to put it this way. But uh, if we don't start it, you know, with the individuals, we're never going to achieve that. Great, thank you. So I'm going to get one of the questions from the chat from Fiona saying, "Thank you for your presentation. I'm interested in the role of volunteers in events that you are involved." Can you give some examples on how they are used or how they are central to, to the events? Yeah, the volunteer is very cultural driven as well. Uh, some countries allow the volunteering of the volunteers. Some countries is a bit more difficult, uh, such as Brazil. Uh, Brazil is very hard to get the volunteer 
process um, legally, if you want to put this way, because um, yeah, it's just a characteristic in the US uh, is very much volunteer driven the event. So Miami Open has a very big uh, volunteer base and the process uh, are different. It goes from tournament to tournament, but I can tell you in Miami is pretty much, you know, they open an online process. Every, anyone can uh, be part of it. And then there are the benefits uh, that you get being a volunteer, you get free tickets, you get, you know, meals and things like that. Whereas uh, in the in the Middle East, uh, they usually uh, they usually um, hire the volunteers from uh, some organizations that they already know that are have have some uh, some relationship. So it really varies from event to event. But um, yeah, volunteers obviously on the bigger events are are very much you know basis of the event because otherwise you, you spend a lot of money in. Uh, in his staff, which is not ideal. Uh, again, but again, it's just just to summarize the, the the question is pretty much it depends on the base to base on on from tournament to tournament. I want to, I want to follow on that because I had a question here, uh, and I'm going to get to the other questions from from the people from the participants later. But uh, the cultural aspect you mentioned that a couple of times in terms of the importance of cultural aspects depending on where you are with the events. And, uh, and, and also the idea of opening new markets, right? So, you know, you think about India uh, and uh, obviously you had some key players from India coming, you know, you had Leander Pai, you have Mirza, and you have some key players that you want to kind of use it as building that fan base and, 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 and tennis um, um, aficionados, no? Um, and um, so, so how do you work in terms of... of the set of players that you have now that are kind of very good for marketing purposes to open then new markets, right? Yeah, very good question, Sandra, because uh, a lot of the smaller events, the 250 events, uh, ATP, WTA, they are created from, uh, from players that do well from that nation. So I can tell the story that we, we probably know better is that tennis, um, it wasn't a very big in Brazil until Google came up. So Google won Roland Garros the first in 97. And then by 2000, we started having a, again ATP events with Koch Tavares, which, uh, you know, they, uh, they use Google. I mean, we use in a good way, right? But uh, with Google, they were able to create uh, and bring a new ATP event. And, as, and actually, this also brought uh, broadcasting back uh, on the map in Brazil, tennis broadcast. That wasn't the case before Guga, Holanga, the, before Guga won Holanga Ho. Uh, and then, you know, also, you, you mentioned about uh, India. So Leander Pays and Bupati, and, you know, they brought the ATP back in, uh, in the map in, in India. And then you have the Halep. You know Simona Halep, who brought you know WTA in Romania. So we have these smaller markets that are player driven, and and events are created because of that. Obviously, there is an ATP event in Belgrade because of Djokovic, whereas before Djokovic, there was never a chance to have an event in Belgrade because you wouldn't be able to 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 drive the market. So it's it's very characteristic. So we, all, we often take opportunities. You often look at this. Uh, I'm going to use a very good case, very. Uh, uh, recent uh, Emma Haducano won the US Open, as you guys can recall, and it kind of changed the entire market in the UK. Now, all of a sudden, UK wants women's tennis. You, you know, Emma Haducano could actually drive an event on her own. She could probably sell the tickets on her own. What which she did, we have an event in two weeks' time at the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, it's a Champions Tour event, which Emma is going to play one of the sessions, and Emma sold out the session like right away. So. These are the kind of things that you have to be uh, keeping up to and then and, and take opportunity and take advantage. Great. I think that relates to the question from David of how important is that IMG can deliver elite players to play at your tournaments for the su success. So obviously, I know that there is a lot of uh, announcements now about the exhibition at the end of the year where Nadal is coming back, if I saw in, on your Twitter. Um, so how is that relationship between the players that you can get from IMG to the success of the events that you guys organize as well? 
Yeah, it's 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 key. It's vital. We have a very good relationship with the IMG agents. Uh, we speak to them on a weekly basis. Uh, we need them. They need us, right? They need our money for the players. We need the players for for events. Uh, it's a very clear relationship. Uh, obviously, we uh, we also have good relationship with other agents outside of IMG. We need that. You know, Nadal, Feder, or they're not IMG players, but they actually managed by former IMG agents. So. This is an important relationship that it takes time to build uh, of trust and uh, and uh, yeah, I mean it's vital uh, in order to understand also what the players want. Uh, remember, they're also humans. Sometimes we tend to forget that these guys. You know, they're 25, 30 year olds, or even 20 year olds, and they like simple things such as you know. Uh, video games and chocolate in the rooms and things like that. So we often, uh, when we have a good relationship with the agents, we understand what you know what they like and what makes them happy. It also helps to build the relationship with the players. So you were mentioning about the the exhibition Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's a very successful exhibition. Every year we have six uh, players, six men and two women, uh, and then uh, you know it's a very luxurious. Is they have a good time? Obviously, it's Abu Dhabi. But again, we, we try to make them feel home, away from home as much as possible on these events. And, and again, having the relationship with the agents helps us a lot in, in providing this to them. And I had a question actually related to that, which is connected to the branding of, of the sport, right? So obviously, if you look to the kind of the old generation, because we have now the next gen, we have the old gen, and that we're talking about Serena and Venus Williams, we're talking about Nadal, Feather. Um, and and Jok, obviously Djokovic is still on his peak, um, but they were very they they drove the, the 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 sport for many many years, and now we see a kind of transition, um, and uh, and obviously different personalities right coming across. Um, so how do you see like the work behind the scenes in terms of branding the events with the new faces instead yeah. of of the kind of the old faces? You know, I think the ATP did a very, on the ATP side especially, they did a very good job in trying to create the new um, stars of the future, in which, you know, we were lucky with the Tsitsipas and, 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 the, the, and the Zverevs and of the world, and obviously Alcaraz now coming. So, uh, yeah, these are the kids that are going to drive the business, and we are very worried about because obviously we live the best era ever in probably any sport uh, with uh, Djokovic, Nadal. And Federer, and then you have Murray, which you arguably, you know, could be in the pack, and uh, and uh, and is not even mentioned sometimes because Federer, Djokovic, and Nadal are so out of this world. Uh, we know that it's coming to an end, especially if Federer, Nadal. We know, we know, they probably two or three years at max. Uh, hope, hopefully, Nadal can go a lot, little longer, but um, at some point, you know, the bodies are gonna break down and. And we have to be ready. We have to be ready to, to transform this, Sandro. It's um, it's worrying. Uh, I must say, um, when that's you... something that, that the WTA faced when kind of Serena, Serena and Venus, because obviously when you see like the 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 Grand Slam champions after Serena, it like cons- it, it, that is the the nice part, which is you actually never know who's gonna win the Grand Slam and the big tournaments on one yeah. side. But on the other side, you also struggle to have that iconic, mal, you know, image, um, you know. And we saw, you know, Emma Raducanu winning the U.S. Open, but then struggling at the uh, WTA tournament. Yeah. Uh, is that something in terms of brand, thinking about branding and marketing? Is that something that you know tournaments struggle to kind of um, a bit or not? So yeah, they, they struggle. I mean, the Grand Slams are the ones that the pinnacle that the, the makes this, the, the, the athletes famous, right? In, and, uh, you know, the, the Raducanu is a good example. Uh, WTA needed that. WTA needed a new face, a new uh, product in order to, to market around uh, the events. Because in the end, uh, if you don't have this event, if you don't have these players, when you talk about brand, but if you have these players, how are you gonna sell sponsorship? How are you gonna sell tickets? How are you gonna, you know, make the events grow? It's it's impossible. And uh, I, I mean, I mean, again, it's it, it's not only about winning a Grand Slam, Sandra. It's also it's like what is the personality behind winning a Grand Slam, and where is this player from? So 
um, I mean, it makes so much sense for Raducan, which is a player that from the UK is a huge market because if a player, and I, I use a clear example, you know, Krejikova, the girl that wants Holangaho, you know, she's from a small market, Czech Republic doesn't really drive the business. You know, she also is not the you know biggest, I mean, she's an incredible player, but she doesn't come, come as well as Raducanu, who's a nice personality, has a nice background. So these stories also help us a lot to build our events and, and in order to brand the tour. Uh, and, you know, in any other sport, you know, Tiger Woods was, you know, vital for golf. And then you have in soccer and then you have in, you ha always have that personality. It's not only about winning, but it's that personality, that story that tells so much more than, than the sport and then can, can drive the entire business. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating to hear. Uh, I have a couple of other questions here. Uh, what advice would you give to students as to what element of their education or training should they focus if they aspire to take on the sort of role you have? I know, I know that I remember when we previously talked, you said that you were inspired by people coming to when you were at university talking about you know, their jobs and, and their roles. So for you, you know, what are the key areas for the education and training of students that they sh should concentrate? Uh, I often say that if you want to break into this this business, is connect connect to people uh, from the events and try to have as much experience as possible on site. Um, uh, yeah, obviously education is very important for you to have the basis, but the real uh, PhD is when you are in, on the grounds, and it doesn't really matter where. It doesn't really matter if you're the tournament director or if you are, you know, the the runner of something. Uh, and again, I think that every every position is important. I was lucky in my, the beginning of my career to work at ATP, which I could see many different events uh, and experience that and understand better and and have this basis. But I was very lucky. Don't get me wrong. I often say that to everyone that knows me. It's like I was so lucky to be in that position. Uh, but if you're if you're not lucky as I was, just try to connect. Try to be part of these events, big and small, uh, and 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 meet people that is gonna be able to bring you other opportunities. And then in the end, the event world, the tennis world, is all about relationships. It's not about skills. Uh, you know, it's not about being super uh, efficient on something or or the other thing. It's just about you know being having people skills and in, in order to to connect to people that is actually gonna you know. I, I, I want to be very transparent here. I'm only the face of the event. I'm not the one who's just. I have <laughs> the the people who run the event are the ones that should be uh, receiving all the congratulations and. You know all, all, all the all the things that usually come to me because I'm the face of the event. But as a TD, you only orchestrating the whole thing, but you're not actually uh, operating. So please also have that in mind. You need you need a good team. You need people behind you uh, to in order to 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 succeed on uh, the event world. That's very interesting. I have a, we have a former student who ended up uh, working at the Rio Olympics. So she ended up going to the Rio Olympics and lived in Rio for three years or so. And, and it all started because she was a kind of um, got a job at the Commonwealth Games here in 2014 and worked with the right people and was did her job very well, was very committed. And then one of the people who was a senior management of the Commonwealth Games ended up going to work in Rio and took her with, with him. Um, so, and uh, so it's, yeah, that's quite important. That's uh, another great. question here. Uh, do you see tennis tournament formats changing to incorporate more entertainment elements, a bit like cricket that has tried to overcome the quite and maybe boring reputation. Yeah, cricket is such a good best case uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it's a great story. Uh, I'm not a cricket fan, but uh, as I move into London, I, I try to understand a little better. In Brazil, there's no cricket. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a nice story. And I think tennis has been trying that for a few years now. It's hard. Uh, the, the people that run tennis, uh, they've been in this business for 30, 40 years. So, we need younger people in order to to try to innovate and bring new things. And I think this is actually happening now in the next five to 10 years. We're going to have a lot of younger uh, executives uh, in order to to try to, you know, change maybe the scoring. This is something that we've been talking a lot uh, for a long time, uh, changing the the fact I'm not sure if you guys are watching the next gen. There's an event now this week in um, Milan. Uh, which is under the, the eight players, the best eight players under the 21. 
and uh, and they have a lot of innovations on this event. It's on purpose. So instead of sets to six, it sets to four. Uh, there's coaching is allowed, so players can talk to the coaches, which is something that for me it's so it's vital. I mean, I don't understand why a player cannot talk to the coach. You know, every sport, pretty much every sport, you can have the coach because in the end, it doesn't matter what your coach tell you. You have you're gonna have to exact exact tape. So you have to do it. Is the coach cannot get on the court and do it for you? So it doesn't matter. So, anyways, I think these things are add some elements to the to the television as well for the entertainment and also because Sandro, we need a we need. Uh, the, the 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 tennis audience is 65 plus right now we need to actually get the younger generation into to our events to our sport otherwise you're gonna die uh and this is a real challenge right now because tennis is still very much on the 80s and 90s as far as you know entertainment aspects go you know the music there's no noise why let's 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 let the crowd make some more noise or let's put music in between points let's you know generate led content around the court that can you know generate some uh, attention of the event so there there's a lot of lots of little things and i think that you know talk about innovation next gen is a good example if you guys can watch you understand what i'm saying i think the future of tennis is most most more towards that uh, model it's interesting because I've been to, to different events myself. So I remember going to Wimbledon uh, maybe six, seven years ago. And Wimbledon has all the experience about, you know, it's a picnic. It's almost a very different experience, right? And obviously my wife was delighted to come along. She wanted to see the tennis, but it wasn't for the tennis. She, was, she wanted to experience the, the Wimbledon feeling. And then yeah. I went to the, to the um, ATP finals in London, the O2. I went a couple of times there. And it's a very different atmosphere. It's like the music, it's the call for the players, it's the training um, courts outside, it's all the environment with all the sponsors. Um, yeah. And I went to the Davis Cup in Glasgow because obviously because of Andy Murray was playing. That's the only thing we get in Glasgow. It used to be the Davis Cup. You know, so I hear, here's a suggestion for IMG. Just think about Glasgow as a market. Um, yeah. um, um, but the Davis Cup is a very different beast because of the noise, because of the uh, national feelings of supporting the players. Um, and it's, um, and, and that's relates to one of my questions to you. Uh, and I know that we're heading towards the end of, of this talk, but implementation of new technologies. So we saw, for example, the 25 seconds for the serving in order to kind of try to speed up a little bit and also because of, of, of the duration of, of the matches and so on and for uh, and, and for marketing reasons and market reasons as well in terms of, of, of publicity and, and advertisements and things like that. What are the other things in terms of new technologies that you see being implemented, not only in terms of court because they got, they're getting rid now of, of line judges and things like that, but also in terms of the background, in terms of, I don't know, logistics, registration process and so on. So what are the new things that are coming, new trends? I think when you talk about, uh, yeah, technology, I mean, you mentioned the, the, the live, what we call live hockey, right? The calling the lines without the line judges. Uh, the shot clock was pretty much, in my view, was a more of marketing uh, move because the players, the, 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 how can I put it this way? The matches are not shorter now because of shot clock. It's pretty much, you know, they, some players would go over the timing, but again, it was a television thing. It's nice for the people in the crowd to, oh, the clock, the shot is, you know, going down five, four, three. So it does add some excitement. So again, I, I'm, I'm for that. I think that a lot of technology that is being implemented in tennis is, it goes around the data, uh, around, you know, how much the player is, it's running and, and what is his speed and there was the rotation of the ball and and how we make this data available for the fans uh, especially at home so it so it makes tennis a bit more exciting uh, than it is right now uh, some of this data you've already seen it but there's a lot more data that can be taken away from uh, from from the broadcasting and from what uh, you know we currently have uh, you know, to, to make it more appealing again to the younger audience, because then all of a sudden you're not talking about, you know, who won the point, you're talking about, you know, the angle of the ball and how the trajectory went and, and, and these things that, you know, usually we, we never, we never talk about because you didn't have uh, available for us. Great. Um, any, let me see if there's any other questions. 
Uh, anyone, if you have a question that you want to ask uh, Luis, you can also uh, put your hands up if you want, feel free or add here to the... So we have Alessandra saying, thank you, Luis. Uh, it was very helpful to understand in certain aspects that are not always very clear. Uh, Fiona say, thank you for describing the different context in relation to volunteers, very interesting. Um, Jenny said, thank you, Luis. That was really interesting talk that reflects a lot of the areas that students have been learning about the relation uh, to event uh, delivery and experience design. Um, so one of the things that I have here is uh, in terms of um, um, money and intangible gains. So obviously you said that, you know, some events are the you know, first, second, third year may not make money, may break even. Um, but there are also many intangible gains, you know, um, uh, improving the, uh, the the brand visit the, the visibility of the brand, or you know um, the the idea that that organization can actually host large events, so you, you gain trust from the sector. Think, okay, actually, those people can actually run an event. Um, so, what are those intangible gains that you see in an event uh, that are okay? Not only money wise, what are the other benefits that the event can bring? I think, I mean, the, the main one that I think when you make the question is about uh, maybe creating a bigger uh, fan tennis base. Uh, for example, you know, uh, in Rio, this is one of our main goals, you know, with the event uh, is in order to get, have more tennis players and how you can actually uh, change, well, to some sort of community reach uh, program, outreach program. And we have that in Abu Dhabi as well. This is part of the sponsorship of what we have to deliver. We have to teach, uh, well, we're committed to, to teach tennis to underprivileged kids uh, and change a whole uh, community setup. Um, in, in Rio also, is, this is very present for us because of the Rio as a, you know, Brazil is a more poor country. Um, how many lives we can change with the event itself. Uh, we've been teaching, so the kids start as ball kids, but then they become stringers or they become tennis pros. So we, we can really change somebody's uh, life with our sport. And this is this is very important uh, and intangible that, you know, we're never going to be able to, to measure uh, how much uh, we impacted, but I'm sure that we've been impacting a lot of, uh, a lot of people's as well, a lot of people's lives as well. Uh, again, when you talk about uh, also a new event and how you can drive other businesses, right? So, so reopen probably brought more people into our sport. So, how did this develop into you know new tennis academies and how this developing more people wanting to play tennis at their clubs and how this you know actually unfolds to the you know the professors and 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 the brands that actually work with tennis rackets and balls and things like that. So there's there's a lot of other things that once you run an event, it doesn't have, again, to be as big as Rio, but it does have some other uh, unfolds into the other aspects of the of the, of the the business that we're probably never going to be able to to understand exactly how. But again, this is, this is part of an event. Great. That's great. Uh, and I have a, a, a final question. I'm not sure if everyone has. I have one of my final questions on the list that I have here. But if anyone has, uh, and I'm sorry, Louis, if it's take a bit over eleven. Uh, but I wanted to leave last because I know that you've been answering a lot of questions about COVID and about uh, changes. You know, obviously there is all the restrictions that uh, and, and the debate about the Australian Open coming up and the next necessity of of vaccination and so on. Now. If you take a little bit out of the COVID, right, there is also the politics uh, involved in, in taking an event to a place. And I think you mentioned a little bit about, you know, when you take an event to China or to Brazil or to US or, or to India, they are very different characteristics. Um, how you deal with that? You know, do, do you guys have a team that negotiate those things and, or how those things can influence the, the event itself and, 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 and the organization of the event? So Alexander, you mean about the about the COVID specific, right? Or I the think COVID? there's COVID, but also the politics of the places. So obviously, you know, so in some places, in places you you know you can do certain things, and others you can't. Yeah, no, comp totally. Uh, yeah, we have as a one of these slides. I mean, we have uh, teams, uh, local teams, and they we rely on them for this uh, relationship. Obviously, again, I'm gonna use China as an example. Uh, China being. 
so much driven politics and, and government funded. So uh, we, we rely on the local people to to guide us through this through these relationships and to understand how we uh, we don't step on everybody's on anybody's foot and uh, we actually uh, you know doing what uh, we're supposed to do. Let's put in a way like China. Uh, but again, you know, like Singapore, Australia, we totally rely on these people, these local people to tell us, uh, us what to do. There is no model that we can take from US and bring to Europe or bring to Asia and work. You always have to adapt, uh, adapt, you know, the business model, adapt, you know, the relationships and adapt. You know, I often say this is very personal, but it's funny. I, often, I, I actually adapt my speech, right? When I'm speaking to somebody, I don't know, in Asia, it's a very more calm and very more. But if I'm speaking in Brazil, we have to be a bit more energetic. So even like that, you have to, 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 to change from, from meeting to meeting, from event to event. But again, uh, uh, more, more specific to your question, uh, it is very it's very interesting to deal with this whole different uh, uh, set of rules and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and politics. Uh, but... You know, it's part. I mean, you, you, I, I, I don't know any. I don't know everything yet. So I've been learning. Sometimes you know, you make some mistakes and you, you say the wrong things. But again, it's the it's part of the process. And so far, it has worked out. So uh, <laughs> it's very I, interesting about that. I was invited um, years ago to talk to people from the Chamber of Commerce here who were about to go to Brazil to do deals for the mega events, the Olympic Games, and the Football World Cup. And one of the things they were talking about was every time they tried to, to go to Brazil to do business, it was never only business. They always felt that they had to be kind of friends of the people, going to the barbecues or the parties or going before you can do business. So that is obviously the, the, the cultural aspect is always uh, uh, very fascinating. And I kind of, I recognize myself because in Brazil, when someone comes just with a business talk, you always kind of be suspicious, like in terms of, is this person trying to take advantage of me or how does that work? And, you know, and um, you, 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 you need to gain a bit of confidence completely, on that. Completely, <laughs> completely. Like, I've, I've, you know, in China, I've been to meetings, uh, plus I hate spicy food. I had to eat spicy food because if they told me, like, if somebody offer you food, you cannot just say no. I say, but I don't like spicy. It's like, I don't care. You have to eat. I'm like, ah. And then, you know, or with a translator, you don't know if the person is actually translating what you're saying. It's, it's, yeah. it's, so so it's, there's all these specifics, you know, Brazil, you do business at lunch, you know, this yeah. is the, the culture, you have to have lunch with the person and then talk about, you know, personal life before you get into the business. So, you know, you, you, you learn as you go, you, you, there's no, no book to teach you, but uh, it's a fun yeah. process. Interesting. So, Louis, I, I just want to, uh, to say thank you. I think uh, everyone here is just saying like how great it was for, for the chat. Uh, I really appreciate um, your time. I know how you how busy you are. And again, I just want to say that first I was impressed because I I, I emailed you out of the blue. So I was like, oh, and I really like this guy. He's quite interactive on Twitter. Let me see if I can find his email on Google. And then I tried to email a couple of emails. And obviously, when you answered, I was absolutely delighted and, and how open you were to, to, to offer this talk. So um, yeah, from the bottom of my heart, really thank you for sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience, sh sharing your views about, uh, about uh, the world of, of events and the world of, of tennis. Um, and as I said, when we, we spoke uh, earlier, a couple of months ago, uh, whenever you need anything from, from Scotland or from UWS, uh, you always feel free to, you know, you have a, 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 a good spot here so, uh, booked for you. So you can well, come and visit you. us at any time. Thank you. Thank you. In touch. Hopefully at some point, maybe at Queens next year, we can schedule a trip for you guys to see the event. Uh, awesome. we'll, we'll get Once you get closer, we, we can talk about it. We'll be happy to host you guys and, and do a different kind of immersion of uh, the tennis world uh, so you guys can see what is behind the scenes. That would be lovely. And I'm sure like uh, uh, if students can be involved and, and some of them can hold on, have a look, uh, they would love that. We've been quite lucky here in Scotland with the events that we have here and, and working with uh, festivals. But as I said to you, we don't have many uh, uh, tennis events around here. We had a Legends one in Edinburgh. We have the Davis Cups, but we don't have as many. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I told you every time I, I, I used to take students to London every year. 
and we were always going to visit Wimbledon and have a, a chat with people there. And it's, uh, it's always been, it, it always fascinated the students. So it's, it's a great place and it's a great sport. So thank you again, Louis. I hope you have a, a great rest of the week uh, and I hope to catch up again with you soon. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Louis. That was lovely. Really good Bye. talk. <laughs> thank you.